Good morning. morning. Come on, church. Good morning. morning. All right. You alive and well? Right? Good. (laughs) Here. (laughs) Present. All right. Let's grab our Bibles. Let's go to victory. Father God, we lift up your name right now, and we thank you, Father God, for every opportunity you give us to speak into the lives of those around us, Lord, those who hear us, see us, those who are near us, Father God, we ask that you would reverberate these words, this this spirit, Father God, would flow out of us and into them, Lord, wherever they might be. Father God, that they would feel the victory of your love and your grace and your peace and your mercy that transcends all understanding, Father God, and it, it, it goes beyond the border of our hearts. Father God, we ask that you would touch our families, touch our lives, touch us right now, Father God, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, you know, as your pastor, I have a particular job set. Does anybody know what that job set is? To what? To preach the truth. Right? The relevant, understandable truth. The inspired word of God. Right? I mean, a pastor's job is not just about encouraging their flock. Okay? It's not just about bringing you a feel good message, it's about telling you the relevant truth. Well, I'm going to put a disclaimer. I'm sorry about that. One of my mustache hairs is on my tongue and it's driving me crazy. One of the things I want to talk to you about today is a subject not a lot of churches are talking about. And I want to, I want to talk to you about the subject of hell. I would not be doing my job thoroughly and understandably. I would not be doing my job correctly if I didn't bring these warnings to your life. Today's message is, what is it about this faith that scares the hell out of people? Now, and and what I'm talking about here is I'm not talking about scaring them into heaven, which, you know, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that, all right? But... What I'm talking about right now is if you look at society, people are full of what the enemy desires them to be full of, right? So these people are full of hell. These people are full of dissension, and they're angry, and they're bitter. And anytime a Christian comes up and starts spouting scripture it really rises up the hell inside of them and they get angry and they start spewing and and matter of fact they get so mad that they physically attack people did the bible not warn us that these things would come yes it did if you're not reading your bible you don't know the warnings right you're going to miss it so i'm going to bring it to you today One of the most important things about what happened on Easter was Jesus gave up his life. Well, and then Jesus rose from the dead. What do you think Jesus was doing in between that time? Does anybody know? Taking the keys from the devil. Jesus went to the gates of hell and he took the keys. He said, no longer are you in control of this. He said, they're mine. This is mine. Right? He stood in the face of the enemy and he said, I'm taking from you all authority. You have no authority here any longer. Hell is very important. Hell is very real. And if you don't get it, (laughs) well, you'll get it. When that time comes, right? Hmm. People attack us because of the way we believe and the faith that we have. They don't just uh, attack us physically, they attack us verbally. 
mentally. They attack our families. They attack our character. (laughs) They come against us because I think what we are living, you know, and you don't have to be, you don't have to be the most perfect Christian on the planet. Anybody here the most perfect Christian on the planet? Anybody? Anybody want to raise your hand and get struck by lightning? No? Nobody? Okay, you know. (laughs) I'm just telling you right now, you don't have to be the most perfect Christian to get backlash, right? I mean, you could just say you're a Christian and somebody's going to hate you for it. Well, Jesus said, you know what? Because they hated me first, they're going to hate you too, right? Because they came against me first, they're going to come against you too. You know, there's warnings in here that Jesus has given to each and every one of us. The time that he spent on this planet before ascension, it's coming up this next week, okay? It's very important. During that time that he was here with his disciples, Jesus was going about warning people. It's coming. The end is coming. Don't know when, but it's coming. And if you're not ready for it, if you're not geared up for it, if you're not alert to the things that are going to be happening between this time and that time, you're going to fall prey to whatever is going to happen. Turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 1.9. Hmm. First Thessalonians 1.9. Second Thessalonians, sorry. Not 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1 9. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. You will hear people say, You cannot scare people into heaven. Really? Really? How many times have you heard? That when the topic of hell arises, well, you know, if you're just, if you're just preaching this message about hell, you're just going to scare people away. That's all you're going to do, you know? No, it ain't about that. It's about we need to scare the living hell out of them, right? You know, we need to get them to a point where they understand that the fires of hell are real. And that their life is heading in that direction. My life was heading in that direction before I gave my life completely and utterly over to Christ. I was headed to hell. I was going there on a first class ride. It might have looked good, sounded good, felt good. But I guarantee you the ending was not going to be good. (laughs) If you don't accept Jesus out of love then it's just fire insurance. Mm. Come on, Pastor. Are these comments biblical or true? I don't think so at all. God revealed hell to us the very, for the very purpose of warning us, scaring us. If, if, if you're getting a warning... All right, what does it say on the back of a cigarette carton or on the back of any pill bottle? It gives you the Surgeon General's warning, right? That warning is not just for purposeful information. It's to scare you to know that what you are about to do could affect your life, right? So God has given us all these warnings. Warning, warning, Will Robinson. You know, he's telling us, be afraid of what you are about to do because it will have ramifications for your eternity. Not just your tomorrow, but your eternity. Now, we have to understand that what we are talking about is, is not the community center. It's not the country club. It's hell. And it's a real place. And those of us who believe and understand the word and the gospel of Jesus Christ, we know that this is a real place. And that 
There will be even people who are sitting here amongst us right now who might experience hell. Sad to say. And not just in this church, but thousands and millions of other churches all around the world. There will be people who come to church every Sunday, but they will not experience the grace and the peace and the mercy of our Lord and Savior, and they will spend eternity in hell. Sad. And I'm going to tell you one reason why that is, is because churches are not teaching the biblical truth. They're telling feel-good messages, right? I would not be doing diligence to you by telling you a feel-good message. I want you to feel good, right? I mean, I want you to, I want you to experience love and understanding. I want you to feel comfortable, I want you to know that there's grace and there's peace and there's mercy about everything that Jesus Christ is. But Jesus Christ also pointed out and he hammered down that hell is a real place and that you don't want to face it. You don't want to go there. Right? (laughs) Hell is real. Now, the natural response to all of this is, People want to avoid it. They want to avoid the conversation of hell. Of course, then God leads us to the uh, solution, Jesus. And the way we can avoid hell and get into heaven. You see, he provided us a way out, right? I mean, if you're going to say, I have insurance hell insurance salvation insurance it better be in the life of jesus christ that's your only ticket out that's your only way out we were created in god's image and and if we're created in god's image we were created with his emotions logic And natural response to real danger. If we're not responding to real danger, then we're really not scared of what's going on around us. Right? Are you alert? Are you knowing? Do you understand what is about to happen? Look at what's going on in our country today. All hell is breaking loose. Right? I mean, the Bible has warned us that there will be wars and there will be rumors of wars. Are we not living that today? Are we not in this time where we are talking about there's war happening, but then there's also rumors of war possibly happening? Come on, church. You better be alert. You awake? Don't be woke. Be awake. Right, right. Think about the absurdity of this kind of thinking. If it were applied to the typical human experience, okay? You can't scare people into not standing on the train tracks when a train is coming. Okay? I'm just telling you there's idiots out there who think that, you know what? I am indestructible. That train is going to stop. You can't tell me that what is about to happen to my body when that train hits me full force is not going to affect me at all, right? Until they are a bloody mess, scattered all over the place. Well, it's a little late now. Yeah. That's just life insurance, (laughs) amen? You need to tell them how much you love them. By telling them the truth. By scaring them into knowing that what they're about to do will have permanent, eternal ramifications on their life. If we don't love them, we will skirt around the subject. You know, I often heard my parents tell me, you know, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. What? You're about to spank my hind end. And it's going to hurt you more than it hurts me? I can see God saying that. I love you enough to discipline you. I love you enough to give you what you need to keep you out of what 
you're about to do. I want to discipline you. This is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. (laughs) If we don't warn them of the dangers of the crash that is about to happen, then we're failing. We're failing in our gospel message. Amen? You can't scare people into not destroying their life with drugs and alcohol. (laughs) Yeah, you can. Tell them the truth about what it does to them. Right? I mean, I'm speaking to all the addicts out here, right? Those who know, me included. If if somebody would have came along early enough and told me what drugs and alcohol were going to do to me, how it was going to cloud my mind and change my uh, ability into a disability. Come on. Right? We would have went the other way. We would have turned tail and ran away from it instead of running to it because everybody that we were hanging out with made it look glorious and magnificent, made it look fun and possible. Right. That's right. Danger is always around the corner. How we face it, how we face it is how we are prepared for it with knowledge. If, if we are not looking at the, the logical response, if you're not looking ahead, then you're not going to know how to respond to that dangerous situation. We're not going to know. If, if we're not warning people of what God has been warning us about, then why are we even trying to share the gospel? Does that make sense to y'all? You know? Y'all are some of the smartest people I know. I'm just going to tell you that right now. I'm not just trying to puff you up or pat you on the back. But because you believe in Jesus Christ, because you get into the word. Y'all are some of the smartest people I know. And I applaud you for doing that. Right? Because knowledge and understanding comes from being and doing what God has asked us to do. Right? If we don't practice, we don't become better at it. I'm not going to say perfect. Right? Practice does not bring about perfection. It just brings about more need for practice. Right? I mean, you know, I can lift weights all day long. If I'm not doing it every day, if I'm not increasing the weight every day, then I'm not going to become stronger. If I'm not reading God's Word and digesting it and understanding it, I'm not going to become more knowledgeable. I'm not going to be able to ward off those dangers that are about to come at me. And you know the enemy is going to come at you, right? I mean, some of y'all, we experience it on a daily basis. You got a new level, you got a new devil, right? And he's bigger and badder, and you got to buff up, and you got to fight more, you got to push more, you got to read more, you got to do more. (laughs) Yeah. Here's what you might hear. Well, they chose it for the moment, but it's for the wrong reason, so it won't last. Really? And what what scripture teaches that? There's no scripture that teaches that. (laughs) Who gets to look into the person's heart and judge their motives? It's not me, right? Only God gets to do that. Only God gets to do that. We're not to be judging people. We're to be helping people we're to be getting knowledge to people all right if i'm judging you for what you're doing i'm wrong i'm going to be judged twice more than what i'm judging you if i'm not helping you understand what god wants to do for you then i'm failing it's just a failure of the gospels it's a failure of our ministry Is there such a thing as an insecure or non-authentic conversion? 
You bet your bottom dollar there is. You bet your bottom dollars. I can't tell you how many people are sitting in churches today who that's all they are doing. They're just there maybe because their spouse drug them to church. You know, maybe because their mom and dad brought them to church. <laughs> They're just there. They're non-authentic conversions. I know this will look good to my parents if I go up front and, you know, give my life to Christ. You know, mom and dad will pat me on the back, maybe give me an ice cream cone after church. Right? Non-authentic conversion. However, nowhere in the scripture will you find teachings that someone converted to Christ because the truth about hell scared them to it. It's automatically a false conversion. In fact, in light of sheer amount of teaching on hell in the Bible, I believe you could make a good argument that hell should be the primary topic in evangelism. Right? I, I mean, that's the one place you don't want anybody going. So... All of the gospel should possibly be centered around keeping people from going to hell. Some people tried it. The fear of hell needs to be the front and center of the reason for conversion. Amen? Hell is scary. Scary enough to send you looking for Jesus. It should be. Right? I mean, hell should be so scary to you that you are on your face daily. That you are prostrate before the Lord every time you get a chance to get down and get low. Right? Sometimes you got to get down and get so low, that's the only way you're going to get high. Come on. Right? It is altogether appropriate to scare people about things that are truly scary. If you don't like hearing the truth, then you can just turn me off. Right? Because I'm going to tell you, you know, stop listening if you don't like it. If you don't like what you hear, stop listening. You don't like what you see, stop looking. You don't like what I'm preaching, I'm sorry. Tough. Get over it. I'm going to continue preaching on whether you're listening or not, because somebody, somebody's going to hear it, right? I'm telling you, <laughs> I'm telling you, you know, what will keep you out of heaven. And then if I'm not telling you what's going to keep you out of heaven, I'm not doing it right. I told my kids about promiscuity and drugs and crime and dishonesty and yes, when my kids were little, I told my kids about hell. Why? Some people might say, you're such a bad pastor scaring your kids like that. You should be ashamed of yourself, so-called pastor. You should stop being a Karen and read your Bible. Come on. You know, I'm just telling you the facts. When I gave my life to Christ, I wanted my children to know what that felt like. I wanted them to know that these things that you were about to do, that you're about to face, because your friends, your peers are out there, and they're going to push you into doing things, and you need to be scared enough to know that you shouldn't do them. Amen? It ain't just about fear about coming home and facing dad and the lashings that you're about to get. It's about the fear of getting past me and going to God and saying, you know what, I failed you. He's the one you need to be more worried about than anybody else. I failed you, Father. I failed you. Because once that point comes and you get to heaven and he says, get away from me because I know you not, that's too late. You're right. It's too late. Come on, man. I tell them these things, and I, I tell y'all these things because they are all scary and real, and because I love you. You know, 
If I didn't love you, I wouldn't tell you. I would just tell you Jesus loves you. Yes, I know, because this is what the Bible says. So, you know, I didn't even get the song right. If I'm telling them a truth about these things and it scares them away from them and towards the wholeness, the awesomeness of godly choices, then scaring them is a good thing. It is a good thing. Amen? Based on today's common opinions, you often hear answers like this. Why is scaring someone about hell by telling them the God-revealed truth about it typically pictured as the wrong thing to do and the wrong approach to evangelism? <laughs> it's not. It's our evangelism. If, if what I'm telling you about the re revelation of God is truth, it's not a bad thing. But people are making it out to be a bad thing. Why would I want to go to an all-loving so-called God who wants to persecute me and send people to hell that I love? Well, it's because they're not wanting to believe. They're not wanting to follow. They're not wanting to obey. They're not wanting to trust. Why is it that someone choosing Christ because of the thought of spending an eternity in hell, is somehow less real, less sincere, or less resulting in salvation. Because everyone wants a feel-good, tickle-me-elmo message. Right? I mean, y'all could go and listen to those people all day long. All day long. But when your time has come to face God what are you going to say to him when he says, didn't your pastor tell you, uh, warn you about hell? Didn't, didn't, he, didn't he say something about it? Well, you guys will be able to say yes. Yeah, he, he told us. Are you paying attention? I hope so. Right? Amen? Amen? All right. You guys are paying attention. If the reality of hell drives someone to repent and beg God to save them from hell... Why is that somehow not an appropriate gospel message? Right? I mean, if, if, if telling them, warning them, showing them the product of what hell can do brings them to repentance, by God, you've done your job. Amen? Here is what I hear routinely from otherwise sincere and loving Christians. That you can't throw hell at someone in the course of trying to witness to them because if they choose to accept Christ, they are only doing it out of emotional response. Really? Really? What do you call a response that is a result of a message of love? I'm going to repeat that, okay? What do you call a response that is the result of a message of love? Last time I checked, love is an emotion, right? If we choose a strict, strictly factual, intellectual approach, is, that, is, is the fact of hell a fact ever bit as much as the fact of heaven, you can't have one without the other, right? You're shaking your heads, right? So what's your point, Reverend? <laughs> My point is not to limit God. Not to limit God. Get the point, right? He told us about heaven and he told us about hell. He gave us emotions. He gave us intellect. I know there's a lot of people out there right now that are not using it. You know, I won't talk about the, the government. Anyway, he told us about Jesus and he told us about Satan. There's a lot of things that we can learn from the Bible, but you better learn this. Hell is real and so is Satan. 
Heaven is real and so is God. Amen? You don't get one without the other in this book. If you're reading it, you don't get one without the other. He told us about salvation. He told us about eternal punishment. Everything God has revealed to us is an appropriation in trying to share the gospel. It's a, uh, 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 not appropriation. It's an, what's the word I'm looking for? I didn't type it out here on my notes. I, miss, I misspelled it. It's a preparation. Mm, there it is. All right. Okay. Sometimes a message of love, listen to me, sometimes a message of love and hope draws hurting souls, right? Sometimes a message of hellfire and punishment crumbles the prideful and arrogant, amen? Different people, different strokes for different folks, right? All right, we need to appeal to all people on all levels, all levels of the human experience. Come on. So, some will be loved into the kingdom. Some will be scared into the kingdom. Some will be convinced logically into the kingdom. I believe it is a trick of Satan that has convinced Christians all around the world you can't scare someone into heaven. Right? I mean, we have a whole generation that doesn't like confrontation. Right? They're scared to talk to people. You know, I'm scared of rejection. I'm scared of conversations. I'm scared because they might say something to me and I just don't have an answer for it. We don't like confrontation. But confrontation is necessary when it comes to teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It causes us to water down the truth, to be compromising, wishy-washy, intolerant, or timid. And not the good kind of timid either. We're talking downright scaredy cat, timid. Curl up in a ball, crying in the fetal position in the corner with your blanket and your coloring book in your safe zone, kind of timid. All right, family, we're talking about eternal destination here, right? You get one shot. You don't get a second chance, right? I know we've heard many stories about people who have died and went to heaven and have come back and told this magnificent story about what heaven was like, and they have this total life conversion. That's, that's their second chance, right? Right? I mean, God was apparently doing something in them that somebody else needed to see, that somebody else needed to hear. He was using them as a tool. That's really all that was, is I'm going to use you as a tool. I'm going to send you back, and I want you to be excited about what you saw. And I want you to tell people, because you believed this way when you were living. You died and came here, and now you're going to go back, and you're going to live again, and you're going to live a different way. I'm going to use you as a tool. To warn them. Not many people get that opportunity. Amen. We need the whole truth and nothing but the truth. You know, I know it's still true today that when you go to court, you have to put your hand on the Bible and you have to recite that. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. Yes, I do. And how many people lie on the stand? Right. How many of us are sitting in church right now holding our Bible in our hand and lying about it, right? How many of us are going to go home tonight and, and knowing that you heard a message today in church about hell and still go live like hell, right? You know, I, I hope not. I hope nobody in here is doing that. All right, shake your heads no. If I love you into Christ's arms, then the mission is accomplished. Amen? If I scare you into running to him, then the mission is accomplished. 
If I convince you logically through an argument, then the mission is accomplished. If, if I've given you everything I can give you and I'm still giving you more, then the mission is accomplished. Love you logically, scare you to death, but give you information and hope you understand it. And the mission is accomplished. Let's finish this thought with a hypothetical occurrence, okay? All right, let's say, let's say I met a guy, I meet a guy later today, and through, you know, meeting him, we have a conversation, and he asks me about spiritual matters. He's, pretty, he's a pretty proud guy, okay? So picture me talking to this guy, okay? Proud of who he is and proud of what a good person he is. He believes in God, little g, little g God, and thinks he'll be all right when he dies because he's been more good than bad, right? I know, I know people like this. I got, I, got, I got some of them that are living across the street from me. They, they think that, you know, because they're doing good, that, you know, oh, well, God's going God's gonna to bless me. You know, when I know they're not, they're, they're, they're living, and I'm not judging them, I see them, right? Because they're close to me, and I know, I know my neighbors. Y'all know your neighbors? I hope you know your neighbors, right? <laughs> Comments about heaven with this person are met with casual, well, we'll all get there type attitude. Comments about Jesus are answered with, you believe your way, I'll believe mine type of response, all right? Finally, a vivid description of hell is presented to this person. It's finality and the reality of the awful punishment and torment gets his attention. In addition, he breaks down wanting to know how he can avoid the terrible destination of hell. Hell is eternal. It never stops. It never lessens. <laughs> it never lets up. It never goes out. You never get to leave. You don't get any rest. There's no break in vacation in hell. Right? It is turmoil for eternity. It is forever. My mother, I used to play with matches when I was a kid. I know, I was a firebug. And one time, one time, I almost burnt down our house and the neighbor's house. Because me and my friend, we were in the middle of the house, you know, and our parents, you know, my the dads had made it to where it was nice and dirt, you know, because it was just all dirt. It wasn't nothing going to grow there anyway. And so that's where we played. And one time we were playing matchbox, and we had all our army guys out there and everything like this. I thought it would be cool, thought, not the sharpest tool in the shed back then, that I would make this big river going between the two armies. I dug it out. It was nice and wide and deep. We packed it down, and then I went and got the can of gasoline and some matches. Yep, I poured that gasoline in there and lit that bad boy on fire, and it was a fire all right. It melted everything, and needless to say, uh, I wanted to melt <laughs> when my mom got a hold of me, right? My, here's what my mom did. My mom says, do you understand what you could have possibly have done? And I said, obviously not. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm crying. You know, I'm like, no, I don't know. She took me in the house, and we had one of those old gas stoves, and she lit the big burner and turned that flame up on high, and she held my hand way up here. She goes, can you feel the fire? And I said, well, I can feel it, yeah. And she <laughs> held my hand closer. She goes, can you feel the fire? And I said, yeah, I could feel it. And she held my hand closer, and she goes, can you feel the fire? And I said, yeah, I can, I can feel it. And she held my hand for just a second right down on top of the flame. And she goes, can you feel that? And I said, absolutely. And she goes, can you imagine if our houses would have burnt down? 
what we would have felt. From that point on, I never played with matches again. She brought a reality to me. You know, she gave me awareness, a warning, and an understanding. That if you play with fire, it's not only you that's going to get burned, but it's those that are in close proximity to you that could get burned as well. Right, ladies and gentlemen? I, we're living this gospel life. We're living this faith-filled life. If we are not giving the warnings, if we're not heeding the warnings, those around us will be burned. They will be included in that. Why? Because they're following us. Right? You know, my grandchildren, they follow me around the house sometimes. You know, if they hear me saying things that I shouldn't be saying, who do you think is going to repeat that? They are. You know, they've often done it. And I'm like, oops, maybe I shouldn't have said that. You know, if, if, if we're not living this truth, they're not going to live this truth, right? And, and I don't want to burn, so I don't want them to burn. Amen? Turn your Bibles to Matthew 3.12. Matthew 3.12. Let's do some scripture. Matthew 3, 12. Come on, Reginald, get over there. There it is. Matthew 3, 12, it says, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn, and burning up the chaff, Mm. with unquenchable fire. Unquenchable fire. That's fire that cannot, will not ever be put out. Matthew 13, 42. Matthew 13, 42. Matthew 13, 42, it says... Should have brought my glasses... Matthew 13, 42. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mm. Mark 9, 43 through 44. Mark 9, 43 through 44. Must have been important. I had it underlined. Mark 9, 43 through 44. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Mm. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. Mm. And then 44, which I don't know if in some of y'all's Bible it doesn't put it in there for 44, but if you go down to verse 48, it'll tell you where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Mm. You will always remember what you lost and you will always regret your decision not to accept Christ. When you're in, you know, if you're in hell, you're going to think about that. It's going to nag you to, you know, well, I can't say to death because you're not going to, you're not going to die. Right? But you're always going to have that thought in your head, I should have accepted Christ. I should have never rejected Jesus. I should have, I should have listened more to the gospel. I should have maybe went to church. Maybe I should have listened to my grandma when she was praying for me. Maybe I should have got on my knees with my mama when my mama was praying for me. Maybe I should have went to that prayer closet with my daddy. And maybe I should have wept and cried with him a little bit. Maybe. Maybe. But maybe it's too late when you're already in hell, right? Maybe. maybe. No, not maybe. Eternal. It's done. It's already signed, sealed, and you've been delivered. Amen? Turn your Bibles to Luke. Luke 16, 19 through 28. Luke 16, 19 through 28. My Bible is falling apart. If you don't have a Bible that's not falling apart, you're not in it. Look at that. Whole section just fell right out. Woo! Glory to God. Luke 16, 
Glory to God. Glory to God. All right. Luke 16. That's where we was headed, huh? Mm hmm. 19 through 28. It says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple. Just leave it there. And fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Ugh, disgusting. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels cried, carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Buried in hell where he was tor in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. In hell, you will be thirsty and never get a drink. In hell, you will long for relief, but it will never come. In hell, you will beg for rest, rest but it will never happen. Nothing you wish for will be granted. Hell is a place of tremendous physical suffering and pain that will never lessen or be relieved. No matter how much ibuprofen you take in hell, it ain't going to help, right? It ain't going to take the pain away. I hope y'all are getting this. Turn your Bibles to Luke 16, 24. It says, Luke 16, 24, it says, So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this place. You will be bitter in hell. You will be angry in hell. You will be frustrated in hell. And you will be desperate for all eternity. Does that sound like a place you want to go? Right? Why is it so appealing to people? I don't understand it. It ain't the country club life I want to go, you know. It's not going out to the golf course and hitting nine, right? It's eternity spent in turmoil, but yet people are continuing to live this satanic lifestyle by saying that, you know, they want to believe in Satan, but they don't want to believe in God. Well, you can't have one without the other, right? If you believe it in Satan, apparently there must have been a God. Because Satan was in heaven with God and decided to be stupid. Stupid. All right. Matthew 13, 41. Let's get on with this. Matthew 13, 41 through 42. Matthew 13, 41 through 42, it says, The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will weed out His kingdom, everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mm. Matthew 24, 51. Matthew 24, 51. It says, have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. <laughs> Was that 2451? No, sorry. I thought I was there. Put your glasses on, Reginald. He will cut them to pieces and assign and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's a whole lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth going on. Hell is a place of darkness. Hell is a place of loneliness. Hell is a place of frustration and desperation. You will be in pitch blackness, all alone, 
without God forever and ever with no point of reference, nothing familiar and no way to get a use to it. Y'all ever stumbled around in the dark of your house? Yeah, I mean, so black. I mean, the street lights are out. No lights in your house are on. And you can't see your hand in front of your face, right? I'm telling you, it's hell when you step on a Lego and you're barefoot. That's hell. If that's hell, I don't want to feel it anymore. I don't want to go there. You know, tripping over a toy or stubbing your foot on a bench. Ouch. Right? That's nothing compared to what you would experience in hell. You would be stumbling around in the dark for eternity being tormented, tormented. It would feel like, they say it it feels like your flesh is being ripped from your body and you, you 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 can't see what's going on. You can't see who's doing it. It would be constant nagging pain. The kind of pain that you wish you could get rid of that would stop but it will never, ever, ever go away. Matthew 8, 12. Matthew 8, 12, it says, but the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's go to the scariest book of the Bible, Revelations. Revelations 23, 23. Verse 3, he threw them into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. Just because you get to heaven doesn't mean you're saved. Right? Because there's going to come a time in heaven where Satan will be released to see who he could sway away. We got to be prayed up, right? We got to be ready. We got to be alert. He will be the ultimate exile and rejection from God where you will never have another chance ever to appeal to God, to see God or to accept God. That's not something I want in my life. Church, is that what you want? Come on. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 through 9. Again, it says, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. That right there is saying that you will not be recognized by God any longer. He'll still remember who you are. But you won't have any contact or relation with the Father. Now let's go back to this guy. So I shared the gospel with this guy. Okay? The man accepts Christ. He's he's relieved that he will not face the fires of hell. You can't be scared into hell according to common Christian wisdom today. So people will walk around with a false confidence in their salvation only to find themselves in hell anyway because of their emotional conversation based on the fear of hell and that it wasn't a real conversation at all. Come on, folks. You got that, right? Let's end this myth, okay? The myth about fire insurance, and you can't scare someone into heaven. Sure you can, and you should. I'm Reverend Reginald K. Lewis, Jr., and I'm giving you permission. Scare them into heaven. Right. You know, uh, you know, I now I didn't say go physically beat them. Right. I didn't say that, but I'm saying that you have permission and, and this is in God's word. OK, 
Okay? Whatever it takes to get them into the hands of the Father, do so. Tell them the truth. Just tell them the truth. Don't sugarcoat it. Tell them the truth. Hell is real, and it's a place you don't want to go. Right? I'm telling you, church, as mature, discerning, wise, and shrewd Christians, we should utilize the full, and I'm talking the full spectrum of eternal reality when trying to reach people for Christ. People are different. They will respond to different parts of the gospel. Some will respond to a loving appeal. Others will only wake up when the fear of hell breaks their hard heart and they feel the fire breaking off of them. Amen? I'm telling you what, there's no better experience in your life when you're talking to someone who's hell-bound and you see them change. When you see the reality overtake them and they say, I don't want that. Right? And hell breaks off of them. The fire falls off of them. And they're released. They're a whole new person at that time. You know? Amen? And still, we're going to have those kind of people that if we're not read up, prayed up, we won't reach them because of the logic of the evidence. Okay? Listen, we've got to love them. We've got to scare them. We got to nag them, but most important, we've got to lead them. Okay, if we're not leading them, we've lost them. Just get them into the arms of the Savior and out of the flames of hell. Let's pray. Lord God, help us realize that people are all different and respond in different ways to different parts of your gospel. Help us embrace everything you have revealed to us, including the reality of hell. Help us love people towards you and to scare people towards you. James 1.22, James 1.22, it says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Do what the word says. Ladies and gentlemen, if we are not telling them the truth, if we're not sharing the truth, if we're not being an example, if we're not leading them, then they're lost. And we failed. What's the most obvious Bible truth you have learned here today? Can somebody tell me? Hell is real and scary. And I need to tell someone about it today. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Father God, for all you've done and all you will do. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you for this time. Thank you for <laughs> the attention that you have brought to your people. Lord, give us the opportunity to tell someone today about your love. Help us to get them away from the flames of hell. Yeah, we might be persecuted for the things that we talk about and the things that we believe. But Father God, I would much rather lose this flesh bag instead of letting it burn. They might be able to kill the physical body, but they will never, ever kill my spirit. Thank you, Lord. Take us from this place today, Father God. Let our eyes be open. Let our ears be open. Let us have a manifestation of the Spirit, Father God, that overwhelms us and overwhelms those that are near us. We thank you, Lord, for your time and for your ear. Listen to your servants, Father God, as we pray. We want to touch people today. We want to touch people today, Father God. In Jesus' name we say. Hey, if you don't hear it anywhere else, you're going to hear it right here. God loves you, and so do we. amen. Come check us out. Oh.